All right, great. So uh, welcome, welcome to uh, welcome to my kitchen. Uh, um, if you know those of you who don't know me, my name is Zach Miller. I'm the baking pastry instructor at the New Orleans Culinary and Hospitality Institute. I've been teaching there well since we opened for about a year and a half now. Um, before that, I was teaching at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, for three years. Before that, I was you know a pastry chef at a ton of different places, New York and New Orleans and Washington D.C. That those kind of places. Uh, it's kind of all over the place with that. Uh, just so you're aware, I do have a dog, and you may hear her in the background. She's my, my sous chef, so uh, if you do hear her, she's, um, uh, I do have a dog, so we may, uh, we may she may chime along uh, here and there, or you see, may see her, hear some jingling if she comes in here wishing for food. Um, but to get right off into it, we're going to start off with our biscuits. So um, a couple things I want to talk about with biscuits. These, I'm going to go for more of a tender biscuit with this. I love a really, really good tender biscuit, but really to determine that happens, it, it's the size of the fat, the size of the butter that you cut it in, really that's, uh, that's going to determine it. So I'm going to go for a more tender biscuit. And my flour, you can see I already have it in my bowl, but the flour I got was actually bleached, the one they had at uh, the grocery store. See if you can, I don't know if you can see that, but it does tend to clump up pretty easily. So with bleached flour, so I'm actually going to sift this flour. So I've got another bowl here and my sifter. At this point, I'm gonna have the remaining dry ingredients. So I've got my salt, my baking powder, and my sugar. All of my dry ingredients are gonna go right in. And I'm just gonna give it a little mix with your hands because you know it's fun. That's we you know that's part of the fun of doing this. So I'm just gonna give it a little bit of a sift before I go into it. If you're using uh, unbleached, which is my preference generally for uh, most of my flowers, you can forgo this and it'll be just fine. You can do something called a uh, whisk sifting as well, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So if you don't have a sifter, you just put everything together and you use a whisk and that'll help break up the lumps in there as well. We'll also aerate the flour, which is not something that we're really concerned about with biscuits. And also remove any lumps or anything like that that you may have in your flour. It's really three, three reasons why we want to sift it. So I'll make sure everything goes through and set that aside. So this will go back into my mixing bowl. And I'm going to get my nice cold butter. So I've got my butter from my fridge and you see I've cut it into very small cubes. These are, I'd say about half an inch at the largest. So the smaller you, you, they are to start off with, especially if you want a tender biscuit, the quicker this is going to go. But this is what's known uh, in pastry lingo, pastry biz as cut-in method. So you usually see like the old pastry blenders and stuff like that. We're gonna do it in my stand mixer because, well, I have one, so why not, right? So if you don't have one, you can use a regular mixer. You can use a pastry blender as well. A couple forks if you'd like to as well. Uh, or you can even do it if you have a, a large cutting board like mine uh, with a, a chef's knife. You can kind of cut it in that way, kind of chop it in, which is kind of fun, but a little bit noisy and a little bit messy. So um, my wife will get mad at me if I made that big of a mess in my kitchen uh, today for this. So uh, we're going to start off with our cube butter, our cold cube butter. That's going to go in. Jeff, Zach, I have a question, um, two questions, because I have one and someone else had another one. Uh, what about doing it with their hands? How do you feel about that? You can. Uh, I tend to have hot hands, um, <laughs> so I, I generally try and steer clear, but you can actually get in there and kind of press it in together like that. And what you're doing, if you can see, I'm kind of trying to make a little bit of a mess here. As I'm pressing in, I'm forming kind of a little bit of a flake in there. I don't know if you can see that really well, so you can see how thin it got. And that, if you're wanting a flaky biscuit, that's what's gonna give you a flaky biscuit. So um, I've actually developed a technique that we, we teach at the school for biscuits that are kind of a hybrid between tender and flaky, because that's always kind of the, the uh, kind of the debate among biscuits, right? Biscuit lovers, you want tender and you want flaky. So I kind of developed a hybrid one where I, I do this technique where I'm mixing it in. I'm gonna get that going on low speed to start off with so I don't make that big of a mess. Where I, I we're shortening the dough actually. So you guys have a whole other shortbread, right? Really what that is, is it's the fat that's kind of coating the flour particles and keep, and it interferes with the gluten formation. So you have a really nice 
uh, tender products. So you think of like shortbread, those shortbread cookies and things like that. And that's really what we're doing right now is we're shortening the gluten right there. We're coating all the fat particles. And if we want something flaky, we still want pieces of butter in there. So we want large pieces of butter to get something flaky. And we want very, very small, the butter to almost disappear in there and almost be kind of sandy in there. Uh, and that's gonna make a very tender product. So I actually kind of split the butter up. I usually take about a third of the butter, put it in the beginning and mix until I can't see it anymore. It's gone. It looks kind of sandy looking. And then I'll add in even larger chunks than that. Even you just kind of slice the butter uh, off the stick of butter that you get, put it in there, mix it a little bit so you have these butter chips in there. And then when you roll it out, you have these layers of butter in there that are kind of melt and keep, give you kind of that, that flakiness. So I kind of created a hybrid technique where you get kind of tender and flaky at the same time. Now, some people will say you need to freeze the butter and grate it and everything like that. I think that's that's a lot of work to go through too, uh, to get a biscuit. And you know, I'm I'm lazy sometimes, so that's, I I don't do that um, all the time. So it's just especially when you're scaling up. If you have to make 200 biscuits in a hotel or something like that for an event, that's a lot of grating of butter and things like that. So this this will work just as well. So, but uh, good question. So now I'm going to prepare my wet ingredients. So I have a bowl here and I'm going to have uh, two eggs that are going to go in. So I'm going to crack those. And like I said last time too, uh, if you joined me last time, I always crack on a flat surface. If you crack kind of the edge of something, that's how you get those pieces of shell in there. So if you crack on a flat surface or even against the other shell, which is a habit I get into as well, that works as well. So I'm going to get my cold ingredients. Make sure I grab the right ones. <laughs> so this one uses, I use sour cream and milk in here. Now I'm just going to mix these a little bit together because I don't, once I add the white ingredients, I don't want them to mix much longer than I have to. I want them just to come together. Otherwise you end up with a tougher biscuit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add my wet ingredients together. Jeff, Zach, are there any substitutes for those that people might be able to use? Um, if you wanted to substitute, you can even use um, like a tofu sour cream. Whoops. Would yogurt work? You could use, if you wanted to use buttermilk, if you didn't have sour cream, that would work. Say again, I'm sorry. Would yogurt work? Plain yogurt? Yogurt would work if you had yogurt. That would that would be perfectly fine in there. You okay. want that nice acidity mm -hmm. in there. It gives it that, that tanginess to it. If, uh, can you tell people about how to make their own buttermilk? Uh, if you don't have buttermilk, you can, add, you can actually take uh, milk and add a little lemon juice to it. It kind of makes it that, that sourness. Uh, you don't get the cultures or anything like that, but for something like this, It'll work um, for very similar. Thank you. So I'm going to just start mixing this a little bit, just to break up the eggs, make it a little bit easier to incorporate. Meanwhile, our butter and our flour and all of our dry ingredients are mixing away. It doesn't need to be completely smooth, but just to kind of pre-mix the ingredients just a little bit to help them out. So you can see, I'll take this off so you guys can see this. starting to get there. We're about halfway there. And you can see I still have some pieces of butter in there as I go through. I've got some chunks. They're right about, um, I would say, chickpea size, maybe a little bit, um, maybe a little bit smaller. But you can see it's starting to look kind of, kind of sandy looking, right? Ooh. Okay, so we're going to keep this going just a little bit longer. 
Chef Zach, someone asked about how much, how much lemon juice to add to milk to turn it into buttermilk. What would the ratio, it's about one tablespoon per uh, cup? I would say for, for a cup, I would add probably a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon. Okay. Uh, that, would, that would give you pretty, something pretty, pretty comparable. You could also, uh, if you had vinegar, you could add a little vinegar to it as well, probably about the same amount. Just something to kind of sour it a little bit. Uh, you won't want to heat it up or anything, it'll start to curdle it. But uh, that, that, would, that would be a good substitute if you didn't have buttermilk or sour cream or yogurt. Uh, I like sour cream. Next best thing would probably be yogurt. Uh, next best thing that would be probably buttermilk. If you don't have buttermilk, then you can sour your, make your own buttermilk with, with the, the milk you have. And how long do they let it sit, like 10 minutes or so in order to sour? I think like yeah, five to 10 yeah. minutes. So, yeah. you know, if you, if you measure, measure that out first and then you just kind of set it aside and measure everything else. And then by the time you've done measure, you've measured everything else and started mixing it, it'll be, it'll be just fine for you to use. Okay. Cool. I see a lot of people cooking along with you, which That's is great. great. I, great. Love I love it. Make sure you all show us some of what you're working on as you're going. I even see some some little ones in here cooking. I love that. <laughs> Sorry if it's a little bit noisy, but um, it's fine. It's part of it's part of the fun, right? <laughs> make a little noise, make a little bit of a mess to the kitchen. So I'll make sure I have my by the way, for those of you I haven't met, I'm, I'm Leah. I do the other cooking and quarantine classes. That's why I'm chiming in here. So nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm trying to find my volume, sorry. Yeah, you sound okay. I can't hear you as well. So oh, <laughs> I had to turn you guys up. Got it. I'm loud too, so that's a problem if you can't hear me. Oh yeah, Wendy asked if you explain the difference between, she got kicked off. She asked about the difference between bleached and unbleached flour. Um, oh, she yes. already discussed it and she said she review it, but I think it's probably not bad for some people that came in late. Bleach, when they bleach flour, they, uh, they actually expose it to clean gas. And those of you familiar with history, I think that's what's, what they use uh, as a weapon in World War I. So it's, um, uh, but what it does is it breaks down the, the proteins in there. They really only use it for, uh, for cake flour. Uh, most cake flour, actually King Arthur did come out with an unbleached cake flour. I've not tried it yet, but um, when I hear it's, it works pretty well. And so what it does is it, it breaks down the, the protein. When we're talking about protein, we're talking about gluten. When we're talking about gluten, we're talking about structure. So that's why cake flour, they generally are going to bleach it because they want to break down that structure with something very nice and tender. So that's why you're going to use see cake flour pretty much always be uh, being bleached. Whereas the other flowers are not going to be not going to be bleached. Um, generally speaking, uh, it's going to break down. You're going to give your uh, give you a little bit more structure from that. So we want for using wheat flour, we want structure. We want the gluten in there. That's what's going to give us some structure to hold everything together. Uh, same thing with um, I think what else has um, gluten flour like barley, other grains and stuff like that. But mostly we're talking about wheat flour when we're talking about this kind of stuff. So there are other, that's why, you know, making products, making gluten-free bread is very, very difficult because it's really hard to replicate that, that structure. So there's a lot of steps you have to go through, a lot of different interesting ingredients you have to use to uh, recreate that. But biscuits, because we want something tender, tend to work pretty well for this kind of stuff. So uh, you can see it's a very sandy type of a mix. I really don't see any chunks of butter in there. So I am, I'm going to consider this ready to go. Okay. Go back on my mixer, and I'm going to add all of my wet ingredients at one time just to make sure I'm going to scrape those down. And I mix this just until it comes together. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Zach. Oh, do you have a question? Nope. Go right ahead. Oh, 
Someone did have a question now. She says, what happens if it gets clumpy and isn't sandy anymore? Did we mix it too long? You didn't mix it too long. Uh, it, it should be okay as long as it's, it starts to clump together. Um, you should be able to add your liquid ingredients and still be okay with it. Uh, but you want to make sure if your kitchen's really hot or anything like that, you want to make sure that, that you, you work fairly quickly with it. And if you're doing it by hand too, you just want to be cautious of, of how, how much you're going to mix it like, like that. So check, you can over mix it. You can uh, mix it so it starts to come together almost as a dough. But you should be able to add your liquid ingredients and, and still save it and still end up with something pretty good. So. Uh, and that's part of the fun. You, you figure out, it's, you know, sometimes there are, you know, what is it, uh, Bob Ross says, are happy accidents, <laughs> you know, this, uh, those little things that, yeah, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's cooking, you know, enjoy it, have fun, relax, don't stress about it. It's, it should be fun and, and, and relaxing and enjoyable. And when every time you make a mistake, you're going to learn something about what you did. So uh, you make more, if, if someone has such happy accidents, if someone comes through, they never make a mistake. They're not gonna learn as much as someone who comes through and screws stuff up all the time. You know, they're gonna like, oh, I've been, you know, this didn't come out. Why didn't this come out? Oh, because of this. There's a reason why. And once they kind of understand and learn how to do that and learn from their mistakes, then you know, that's part of learning. That's part of the joy of this. Is then you get to keep growing and learning from that. So anyway, I can talk about that for a while. But back, back to my biscuits. So good lesson. <laughs> So I mixed it till it's come together. You can see there's just a little bit of dry in the bottom. I'm not sure if you can see that. I want to dump that on the floor. Just a little bit. And we're going to kind of work that together by hand on uh, a bench. I'm not even where I should say. Uh, so you don't want to, you just want to not over mix it. You want to make sure it stays uh, nice and tender. So what we're going to do is we're going to lightly flour. Now, if I was at the school, I'd be much more dramatic with that, but I don't want to have to sweep my floor, so I'm going to, um, <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit less dramatic with that. And it's okay at this point, get your hands in the dough a little bit. That's part of the fun, right? And if it's for Mother's Day, I'm assuming you have kids. This would be a fun thing for the kids to participate in as well. Uh, depending, you know, some of you may uh, have a lot of, I may have a bit of a mess from that, though, so. Uh, but we used to, when I was a uh, kid, we used to bake all the time uh, or help in the kitchen. I don't know how to help, but my mom could probably uh, debate that. But I have pictures of me, well, most likely I was banging on pots and pants instead of actually helping. But um, <laughs> so all of our dough is going to come out onto our flour, on our flour cutting board. And I'm going to use my spatula here. Go. <clears throat> and the spatula is rubber spatula is a great thing. And one of the I uh, used to work with a chef, and he would say, you know, this is the difference between you know retiring with a Ferrari and, and retiring with a Ford at the end of your career because you'll save yourself a lot of money uh, over the course of your career just by straightening everything out yourself. So remember, we measured all of these things too. So all of these things need to go into our mixture. So now, just a little bit more flour. And we're just going to kind of bring it together on the board. I'm not really kneading it and just kind of pulling it together. And I'm flouring it as needed. You don't want to add too much flour to it. You just want to keep it from. And this is a bench scraper, by the way. This is a great tool to have. So I'll kind of almost kind of chop and stack it a little bit. It's a great way to kind of controlling your, your dough on your bench. Okay. So now Chef Zach, I use the bench scraper during all my classes too and at home to just scoop up my vegetables and such as I cut them. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic for doing a lot of different things and usually yeah. you can find them now, I got this one for free from a chocolate company, so um, that's why it's so big too. And I, um, so I have this one, but they're five bucks probably at a restaurant supply store online. You don't need an fancy expensive one. Uh, sometimes the fancy expensive ones that, that don't really don't work as well as the, the inexpensive ones. Okay, so and you, can, you can find them at kitchen stores or like Target. I've even seen them at Walmart. So 
Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty cheap. So now I'm going to roll this to a one inch thickness. And for me, um, one inch is actually the, the width of my thumb. So if you don't believe me. <laughs> my thumb is one inch. <laughs> so I was born, I was designed to make biscuits. That's how it works, right? So, so now I'm going to roll this slightly until I get the thickness of my thumb. Just long, <laughs> even strokes. It's a very soft dough. You don't need to mess around with it too much. So it's the thickness of my thumb. I'm ready to go. Yeah, so there's a question. Yeah, someone asked about egg size. Does it matter in any recipe, the egg it, size? Uh, when you're, whenever you're cooking or baking, we always count on large eggs. Um, large eggs, and pardon me for the, the reference in metric, but it's a large egg on average is going to be 50 grams. The yolk weighs 20 and the white weighs 30 grams. So that's kind of a uh, reason to use metric because everybody else in the world uses metric. So it's, it's kind of universal. Baking and pastry is kind of a universal language. So now what I'm going to do, I've got it nice and even. And when you're rolling dough, if you want to go by feel. You can kind of look at it to see if it's even. But when you touch the dough, you should be able to feel the difference in, in thickness on it. So now, what I'm going to do, so I get some space cleared out, is I'm going to bring my sheet pan over. And I've lined my sheet pan with parchment paper. You don't have to. I have parchment paper at home, so I use it. But you can use, you can just uh, spray it a little bit. And I'm going to pick a biscuit size. So I'm going to use my cutters. I'm going to use, because I like biscuits, I'm going to go a little bit bigger. So these are just uh, little plastic cutters that we use. Uh, these come in our, our students' toolkits. So, uh, and I get a toolkit too. I didn't steal it from a student, so I promise. <laughs> uh, but you can, use, you can use a drinking glass if you don't have one, uh, anything like that. Uh, you can have a biscuit cutter if you wanted to as well. But these come in a set. These are just kind of nice things to have for different cookies and things like that, biscuits, tarts, stuff like that. But anything round, you can, you can use for this. So I'm going to use this. And I'm going to go straight down and just give it a little bit of a wiggle and out it comes. If you twist it, you're going to end up with the problem of the biscuit not rising properly. So now I'm going to keep going and it should stick to my cutter a little bit. That's fine. And if you want to, I kind of like baking them together. I can, you can dip your cutter in flour a little bit if it starts to stick too much. Because I, I like that look if you want to bake them separately, you can bake them separately. If you want to make them little tiny biscuits, you can make little tiny biscuits. If you want to make a big biscuit, you can. So that's kind of where you can decide what you want to do with it. And if you wanted to put, you know, black pepper or cheddar cheese in there or chives or something like that, you can do that as well. So but I like this, a little bit more flour. So Zach, someone asked, she said she's trying to keep up. Does she use sour cream and buttermilk or regular milk? I use re regular milk for this one. If you have buttermilk, if you want to use it, but you're getting the sourness from your uh, sour cream. So you don't necessarily have to use uh, buttermilk with it, but buttermilk will be a substitute for the sour cream if you don't have it. So now this one kind of stuck just a little bit, so I'm going to my bench scraper to get it off. And I'm going to bring this dough together and I can get this one more gentle roll. You don't want to manipulate your dough too much. And when I'm, I'm doing the flour, I'm kind of throwing the flour a little bit so it spreads out a little bit more. If you sprinkle it, you get uh, little clumps on there. I'm just kind of, kind of patting it together. And I'm going to use my pen. I'm going to measure it with my handy dandy measuring tool. So I'm feeling good about that. And then I like to lift up the dough just a little bit just to kind of let it relax. And then back into it. And I think I'm going to get one dozen of the size I chose of my cutter. So it just depends on the size of your cutter. I got one dozen biscuits. 
Jeff Zach, can this dough be made in advance? Yes. Uh, I like, sometimes you can even actually freeze this dough uh, raw and then bake it if you uh, want to. I find because of the leavening in it, because once the leavening of the baking powder is in here, and baking powder nowadays is pretty much all double acting, which means it reacts to moisture and also reacts to heat. So you can let it sit and then bake it later on. So you can even put this in the refrigerator the day before, bake it that morning, or if you want to bake it right now, and these actually freeze really well, this recipe, after it's baked. So you bake, take it out, uh, you can put it in the oven, refresh it, and they, they're still really, really good the next day. So uh, at this point, I'm going to pop these into a 375 degree oven for, I'm going to set my temperature for about, or my time, excuse me. I'm going to check in about 15 minutes. And yes, I still set a timer too. I don't have, I have a really good internal timer, but I'll probably forget about them but, uh, at some point. So in the leftover dough, I usually, because you keep working it, it's going to get tougher and tougher. It's usually a bit of a sacrifice at that point. So you can kind of let that, let that dough uh, go. Uh, another thing you can do with this, if you want to do like a pot pie, you can use this, this dough for that. It's fantastic for something like that. Bench papers are great, aren't they? So I'm going to move this out of the way. Zach, what if people want to use whole wheat dough? Do you recommend that at all for a biscuit? Whole wheat flour would be just fine for this. Uh, normally, I'd substitute, uh, I'd start off with half and half, and then I, you can go from there. Uh, if you want to do all whole wheat flour, that should work out just fine as well. Would the texture be a little different? Texture would be different, flavor would be different. Um, you know, the only thing I would be really concerned about is using rye flour, just because the protein on rye is very, very different. And you'll end up with something that's kind of sticky, as opposed to something that's kind of uh, tender. So it's, it tends to be, uh, rye flour tends to be a little bit more troublesome. But um, I usually start off with a, a combination of, uh, I start with 50-50, I go sometimes two-thirds whole wheat, uh, one-third uh, regular flour. Uh, you can do that as well. So, and you can incorporate other different, different, you know, different herbs and stuff like that if you wanted to as well. So, okay. So now we're going to start off on our gravy for our, because it is sauce week, right? We're going to start off with our gravy. We're going to make uh, biscuits and gravy, right? So I'm going to make my sausage gravy right now. So let me gather my mise en place, right? Fancy word for, uh, you know, basically everything I need scaled up and ready to go in advance. So I have my milk, my flour, my breakfast sausage. I have half a pound of breakfast sausage. I have two cups of milk. I've got two tablespoons of flour. I guess I have more than two tablespoons of flour, but I'm gonna measure that as we go. And I'm gonna do this in a larger pot. I also have salt and pepper handy uh, by my stove, like I always do. So I have my fancy, I've got a little oyster shell uh, for my salt. It's actually ceramic, it's not an actual oyster shell. So. And my pepper mill that I've had for a good probably 20 years. So I've had this pepper mill for a long time. Freshly ground pepper, and this is always the best. So it's very simple ingredients for sausage gravy. Uh, you can use turkey sausage if you wanted to, too, if you wanted to kind of avoid the pork sausage. If you wanted to use basically the same ratio, just leave the pork out. Maybe just use a little bit of butter or even just like a neutral oil to make the brew. And you can do uh, just, a basic, uh, just a basic gravy that doesn't have sausage in it. So. I'm going to choose my weapon here. I like this one. So I'm going to add my breakfast sausage and I'm just going to break that up and let it start cooking and rendering out some of the fat in there and getting nice and brown. Is that just 15 minutes for the biscuits that you put them in? I put them in 15 minutes and I'm going to check them. So 
Uh, my favorite, my favorite question my students ask me is, "How long does something bake?" Mm -hmm. And my response to that question is, "Till it's done." Right? How long does something cook? Well, it cooks until it's done. My oven here is going to be different from your oven. It's going to be different from the ovens I have at, at work at the school. Uh, so they're all going to be different. Uh, my biscuits, you may have a smaller cutter than what I used, and or you know, a larger cutter. They may take longer, they take less. But 15 minutes for me is going to be a good start, and I'm going to to check it. But in case you're wondering, the cutter I used is is three inches. No, I had to hit my handy ruler there. So, or three thumbs wide. <laughs> so while this is starting to brown off, I'm going to heat up my griddle. Or my pancakes. And I'm going about 375 on my griddle. If you have an electric griddle like this, it's great. If you don't, you can have a, a, a saute pan on your stove, will be fine. I like this great for French toast, great for breakfast stuff. You can do all kinds of kinds of different things in there as well. So we're getting this nice and brown. I'm gonna break it up if you want to have a nice gravy. Okay, have to poke it, make a lot of noise. Turn on my fan here. Hopefully, that, let me know if that's going to be too much noise. Let me keep it on low. I can't even hear it. Good. It's a good fan. So now I'm going to get my black pepper ready. I've got a little reservoir. So. Kind of fun, it's like a little coffee milk. And I like I like black pepper. My wife likes a lot of black pepper, so I'm gonna I'm gonna load it up with that and I'm gonna have that ready to go. So we are we are on our way with our sausage gravy. Uh, in the meantime, since we're on the subject of sauces, I'm gonna start my raspberry syrup for my pancakes. So here I have one cup of frozen raspberries. These are from uh, Washington, the Washington Red Raspberry Commission who sponsored our video, was kind enough to send us some raspberries. So this is one cup. Now you could use fresh if you wanted to as well. The great thing, we talk about cooking in quarantine, we talk about use cooking out of your pantry, we talk about cooking uh, out of your freezer. I enjoy cook I mean, cooking out of your freezer, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of Pastry items, baked goods, freeze really well. Um, they freeze really well raw, they freeze really well after they're baked. So we can um, use a lot of these things like that. So I'm going to start off with my one cup of raspberries. And cane or maple, kind of depending on uh, where you're from. I've got cane syrup, I have this in my pantry. So I'm gonna use cane syrup. It's a very unique aroma to it. So one cup, and this will be, this is plenty of syrup for your pancakes. And just one note on that as well. I, um, I'm gonna make half a recipe of the pancakes because I, I can't eat that many pancakes. I probably would eat that many pancakes, <laughs> but you know, I gotta keep nice and trim for my wife, right? So. I'm going to be 44 this year, so I don't want her to trade me in for two 22-year-olds if I get too, uh, 
बीच में है कहते हैं सब And Chef Zach, is this sauce something people can make extra and freeze? Absolutely, yeah. Um, because it's a syrup, they can they can keep in the refrigerator, I would imagine, uh, and we keep really really nice. But I mean, you've got you know you know syrups are generally. I mean, if you use real maple syrup, you have to refrigerate. It. Otherwise, it will get moldy. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn that on and get that started as well. And and what's going to happen is the the raspberries are going to release their juices and kind of cook down. So you end up with kind of a half gam kind of syrup. Auction in there. So I'm going to take a look at my sausage here. It's starting to brown nicely. Is there anything else besides maple syrup or cane syrup that might work in that? Now, if you don't have either of those, if you just put uh, a half a cup of water and a half a cup of sugar in there as well, uh, maybe more if you like a little bit sweeter. Um, I would say a half a cup of Half a cup of water, three quarters of a cup of sugar. So the raspberries are going to release a lot of juice. And then cook that down and you just have just straight up cherry syrup for that if you wanted to. So you can use that generally. Uh, sugar is just fine for that. Um, if you had a coffee, you could probably use agave if you wanted to as well. If you have that around. Did you say honey also? I could use honey. Honey is very strong. I would use like half honey, half sugar, and then a little water in that as well. Um, mm -hmm. You could use honey, depending on your honey too. If you get like a stronger, darker honey, like a buckwheat honey, that tends to be very dark, very strong. Uh, if you have um, a lighter honey, I prefer light honey, you're probably fine just straight up with that as well. So it depends what you have, depends what you like as well. So you can see I'm getting some nice color in, on my sausage in there. Mm -hmm. And it's rendering out some of the, the fat from the pork. Not a lot. So don't be scared. It's a really clean sausage. Now, if you wanted to drain off some of it, you could if you're afraid of all the pork fat. Um, you know, there's a lot of flavor in there. There's not a tremendous amount. But if you want to substitute, you need some fat in there to kind of form a, a roux. So a roux is basically just a mixture of, of fat and flour. And it's really big in uh, Louisiana cooking and you know, Cajun and Creole cooking, they use it almost as a season, a flavoring as well. If you're toasting the flour and they get those really dark roux, that's why you see the gumbo has a really deep, rich uh, color to it, uh, and that unique aroma to it as well, uh, because you make a really nice dark roux. If you're cooking the flour, actually toasting the flour and the fat, so it gets really dark. We're not gonna do that here though. We're gonna make a blonde roux, which basically means uh, it's really light. So we're gonna mix it in with the flour. Uh, and it's a really great way of thickening anything, uh, any like savory sauces or stuff like that. Or actually, you can soup like bases based on it as well. And I don't know if you've ever tried to make a gravy and throw a handful of flour into boiling broth and end up with this uh, lumpy, lumpy mat. So this is a way of kind of distributing the starch, in this case the flour, uh, into the liquid so you do not end up with lumps. So I'm, I'm ready now to turn down my heat. I'm going to add my two tablespoons of flour. And I'm going to stir that into the fat. And you're looking for kind of a wet stand, kind of a kind of a consistency. And this is used to make, make soups and stuff like that. So you can see it's kind of dispersed in there. I just want to cook the fat, the flour in the fat just a little bit, just to kind of get some of the raw flavor out of it, just to disperse it. You don't want to cook it too much, you don't want it to brown. And then I'm going to add my cold milk. And I'm going to stir that in together. That's two cups of milk, Chef Zach? That is two cups of milk, yes. And that's what so I do this together. I usually tell people it's about a, a cup a cup of uh, milk to a tablespoon of flour to thicken. Oh, milk to a tablespoon of flour, yeah. Ta and for a roux, it's, it's equal parts. So it's a tablespoon of uh, oil, of uh, butter, whatever you want to, one tablespoon of uh, flour, and one cup of milk. That's a good 
that's a good ratio. Now you can change that too if you want something thicker uh, or thinner. You can just add more liquid or remove more liquid from that from that ratio. But it's good once you start kind of thinking about things in ratios. It's a really great way of uh, memorizing things or kind of guide you through uh, cooking and, and through baking. They start thinking about things in, in ratios, which is fantastic. So I'm not going to season this with salt because it has the sausage in there. I want to check the seasoning with salt at the very end because the sausage is going to have salt in it as well. But I, am, I know I'm going to add pepper to it because I like pepper. So I'm going to add my freshly ground pepper. I'm going to sprinkle that in there. And that was probably about half a teaspoon to a teaspoon. That is to taste. If you think you've got, if you're using a hot sausage, you don't want to add any more heat to it or anything like that, you can, uh, you can not add it. But I think uh, what kind of makes a salsa gravy a salsa gravy is, is all that, that black pepper. So I'm going to keep this stirring until it comes up to the temperature. I want to make sure I'm distributing that roux in there as well so I don't end up with, with any lumps. That is my timer for my biscuits. I'm going to take a peek. So now I do have a convection oven at home, so uh, it is going to be a little bit faster than if you have a standard one. But you can see I'm getting just a little bit of color on these, but the color is kind of on one side. So I'm just going to rotate them, and I'm going to give those about five, I'm going to four more minutes. Four more minutes. And I'm going to see what happens then. All right? So probably going to be about 20 minutes, 18 to 22 with the three butter, but it depends on your oven. So I've got a convection oven. That just means I've got a fan in there circulating that air. So it's going to bake a little bit more efficiently than if you had a still oven. So I'm going to give this another stir. So Zach, do you recommend people change the temperature at all if they do convection or not? Uh, convection, generally speaking, you're going to go down 25 degrees and you're going to lose uh, anywhere from three to five minutes, depending on what you're, you're baking. So less time, less temperature with convection. Because uh, with convection, you've got two heats, the uh, heat's going into your food two ways. You've got uh, radiant heat, so it's just the heat that you feel like, if my stove's on right now, I can feel that, that radiant heat from it, you know, like the heat you feel from the sun. Uh, then there's convection, which is basically circulation. So this has got two, basically the two types of heat. So it's got the circulation going around with the, the convection, and then it's got the radiant heat coming from the heating elements inside of your, your oven. So uh, it's just a more efficient way of baking. So that means less time and uh, lower, slightly lower temperature. So um, you know, if you have a still oven, I would still probably, uh, a still oven is it's kind of pastry slang for, or industry slang for oven that just doesn't have a fan in it. I would go, I would still go right around 375, maybe 385. I would go up a little bit if you don't have convection, but I would go a longer period of time. Uh, you don't want to be careful though, you want to make sure your baking tray, if you're going a longer period of time, doesn't get too hot because you can burn the bottom of them. Uh, and our, our way of getting around that too is, is if, if you have uh, two, two sheet pans together. And when I talk about sheet pans, let me stir this here. The pan I use is, uh, you can see it's, it's well used, but it's, it's heavy gauge aluminum, but it's a, a single layer of it. If you actually stack two of these on top of each other and then bake on top of that, that's going to give you a little bit of a layer of protection to keep the bottom from burning on something. So now, getting nice and thick as it's coming up to a boil. And my little burner back here is, my simmer burner is actually living up to the same. It's, very, it's barely simmering right now, but I'm going to switch that around here in a moment so we can see our raspberry syrup is starting to come up to a simmer. And being that the raspberries are frozen too, it's, it's gonna take a little bit longer for the heat to, to warm it up. Jeff Zach, someone asked about an electric griddle versus a griddle on the stove. Um, do you have a recommendation of one versus the other for heat control? Uh, for me at home, I like the electric griddle because it tends to, uh, it tends to be a little bit more precise, a little bit more even. If you've got a griddle on like a gas burner, you're really going to have to play around with it and finic it's a little bit more finicky uh, at that point. So uh, you want, just want to be cautious of, of that. So I find an electric griddle tends to work a little bit better for that. Uh, but you know, that's, 
it's up to you if you don't want to. Usually, you can find these electric riddles in pretty. They're pretty inexpensive. All right, so we're getting there on our gravy here. Let me get a spoon. Okay, so as we can see, we are simmering. We can see it's gotten nice and thick in there. So I'm going to give it a little taste. I'm going to add just a little pinch of salt to it. Plenty of black pepper, plenty of spice to it. But just a little bit of heat. I'm going to check my biscuits now. I'm going to turn that off. We go about two more minutes. So you can see my, my gravy's gotten nice and thick there. If you wanted something a little bit thicker, it's remember as, as it cools down a little bit too, remember this is boiling hot, as it cools down, it is going to thicken a little bit more. So we wanna be, be very cautious of that. We don't want a wallpaper paste uh, on our biscuits. I'm gonna be cautious, but I'm gonna put a lid on it right now to keep it warm and keep it from getting a skin on it as well. So uh, actually I'm gonna double check the seasoning before I go too far. Make sure I added enough salt. Very good. Okay. So now, I like to tell everyone so they can be fancy and impress their friends that they just made a bechamel sauce. <laughs> they did just make a bechamel sauce with sausage in it. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. It's one of one of the classic French cuisine known as uh, one of the mother sauces, right? So it's they've got with, with tomatoes. I'm sorry, I'm a pastry instructor, so it's got tomato sauce. Uh, bechamel, velouté, um, espagnol. Is it hollandaise is the last one? Is yeah. One? Okay. Sorry, I'm a pastry instructor, so I worry about the you know pat of shield and stuff like that, jokes. So, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna switch this over to my my stronger burner to get this to get this going. But you can see it's kind of you can see in there. Let me spilling on the floor. Kind of thinned out a little bit. The juices from the raspberries have gotten in there and we're starting to get in there. So we're gonna bring that up to, we're gonna re boil it and we're gonna evaporate some of the water that, that's come out of the raspberries and leave all the flavor behind. So we're gonna concentrate the flavor and get it nice and thick. We don't want it too runny because this is gonna soak into our pancakes. We're gonna have mushy pancakes. Nobody likes those mushy pancakes. So. All right. So now as everything is simmering here, just in time. I'm going to take a peek at my biscuits. All right. So we can see, here they are. Nice and golden brown. I like a little nice golden brown. You can go a little bit paler if you wanted to. Uh, and then these are ready to go. But you can see the bottom is going to be a little bit darker on those. They're really hot. So I really, I'll show you guys them a little bit later so I can hold one in my hand. Uh, another thing I like to do, another little trick I like to do, is take melted butter and brush them all with the biscuits as soon as they come out of the oven. It kind of soaks into them. Um, that's kind of, uh, you know, you don't have to. It's just, a, if you're going to eat biscuits, you may as well go all the way uh, with the biscuits. So, but you can see, I mean, they're really nice. They're going to be really nice and tender. Uh, but they're, they're also really, really hot right now because, well, they just came out of a 375 degree oven. So I'm going to let them hang out there. I'm going to let my raspberry syrup do its thing. It's starting to smell really, really good, the raspberries. Of course, I'm standing right above it too, so that helps. It's starting to smell really, really good. So we have our biscuits and gravy ready to go. We're gonna let these cool down a little bit before we split and top them with our, our sausage gravy that we made. So, In fact, those biscuits would also go great with some raspberry jam, if people. Raspberry have. jam, yeah. I actually have a half ton, um, which I probably won't, uh, we can do like a quick raspberry jam. So if you wanted to do a jam as well, uh, you, you know, frozen fruit works really well for that. The, the frozen uh, Washington red rad, raspberries work, work really well because as they defrost, they're actually going to release some of the liquid. And you, you just go, and really what jam is, is fruit preserved with sugar. So you take one cup, 
of, and we're kind of making a jam in a way with this, but we're going to put it, we can put it down a little bit more. So now you can see, I've got some nice big bubbles in there. It's kind of, and you can see it's got like a little bit of a syrupy consistency to it. And I'm going to let that, I'm going to let that hang out. I think that's going to be where, right where we want it. Okay. Now, if you want it, you can add a little butter to this. If you want to kind of bring out some butteriness, add some richness to it. Not that we need to. Um, another thing to do is if you've got fresh herbs, I've got mint and basil growing in my uh, garden out back in pots. So I can add a sprig of basil to it. I can add a sprig of mint to it and you kind of lighten it up as well that way. So add a little herbal note to it too and, just, and have fun with it. There's certain, um, I've been telling my students too uh, that, you know, so there are certain times where there are rules. You need to follow the rules. But there are other times where the rules, you can bend the rules. And then there are other times where you can break the rules. So it uh, just kind of depends. Like this is a good ratio to start off with, a one-to-one one -one ratio with this. But you can play around with the, the type of syrup that you do. If you want to put a different herb in there as well. If you want to get really crazy and put a little black pepper in there, you could. Uh, you could put a little cinnamon in there as well if you wanted to. Uh, I've got... Um, some Indian spice, I got a lot of spices. Uh, I've got some Indian spices in my spice cabinet as well. So you can kind of start playing around with some of these things as well. And for me, a way to kind of tell, to, to kind of decide if something goes together before you actually put it in there is to smell it. Because most of our, you know, if we're talking about taste, we taste, uh, you know, salt, sour, uh, bitter, sweet, umami. So we've got those tastes, but you know, flavor really is, is, as, is tied with aroma. So those of you who are into wine and wine tasting, so if you're, it's your uncle you know, is watching as well, he knows about this as well. It's, it's all about the aroma. So if you smell things and they smell good together, they'll probably go well together uh, and uh, for, they'll probably taste really well together. So moving on to our pancakes, and I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. If there are any questions, uh, if you want me to slow down, just let me know. I'm going to jump into Someone did ask how long the pancake batter would hold in the fridge. This one, uh, not long at all. <laughs> uh, but you can mix the dry ingredients together. Uh, this is, you need to make it and bake it, uh, and bake it on the griddle right away because it does, it is leavened with egg whites. And those egg whites, you know, anytime you whip egg whites, any kind of, you know, egg foam, it doesn't last long at all. It's it basically, you, you whip it, you have to use it within a few minutes. Uh, you don't have to run, but it's gonna start deflating. It's gonna start degrading very, very quickly. So to start off with, I've got, I'm gonna get all my ingredients around here. All right, so, once again, mise en place, cook in place, basically getting everything ready to go. So I'm gonna have, I have my flour in here, in my larger bowl, I just set up three, I actually bought these bowls just to make all these pancakes, because I found this pancake recipe. Um, shout out to, to Serious Eats, by the way, because that's where I got this from. So it's fantastic. Um, and they're free too, they're not like other online resources. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, so I've got my baking soda, that goes in. Okay, I've got my, what's this one, sugar, that goes in, I've got my salt, that goes in, and my baking powder, all that goes in. So you may have noticed that I do have two different leverages now, I've got baking soda and baking powder in there. Uh, baking soda is basically, it's going to happen instantly, so whenever baking soda uh, combines with this uh, acid and liquid, it's going to start producing gas bubbles, start producing carbon dioxide. And that's going to happen right away. Um, that's another reason why you, you don't really want to hold this. But that's only going to give us part, part of our leavening. Most of our leavening is going to come from the baking powder and from the egg whites we put in there. So why put baking soda in there at all if it's not really do too much for us? Well, it also helps with browning. Baking soda is an alkaline, so it's a base. It's going to uh, raise our pH. So it's going to actually brown your, cause your product to get browner a little bit faster. So, um, you know, things like cookies, you know, some cookies that don't have baking soda in them, they're gonna be a little bit more anemic looking. 
Uh, it's going to really aid in, in what's known as Maillard browning or the Maillard reaction. It's a really fancy chemical way of, of browning. So if you hear like people talking on the Food Network, oh, you need to caramelize your steak. You need to caramelize the outside of this, caramelize the outside of that. It's not really caramelization, it's Maillard browning. It's really, it's the breakdown of sugars in the presence of protein, not to get too Mr. Wizard on you, but it's, that's what it, uh, it really does. So anytime, so flour has protein in it. Uh, we have our sugars in there as well, which is really what starch is and long chains of sugars. It's gonna start breaking down. That's where you get uh, all your flavor from. So, uh, so baking soda does, does help with that. So I have my melted butter. Make sure I don't forget this because I, whenever I make this, half the time I always forget the melted butter because I leave it in the microwave. So I have all of my dry ingredients in here. Remember, I'm doing this a half recipe. But so in there, just to kind of recap, I was on the right page for you. I have uh, two cups of flour. I have one tablespoon of sugar, one teaspoon of kosher salt. Now, let me, I'll come back to the kosher salt in a moment. Uh, baking powder, baking soda, that's uh, one teaspoon of baking powder, one half teaspoon of baking soda. Uh, one egg, I'm, two eggs I'm gonna separate, but I'm only gonna separate one because I'm doing a half. And one and a half cups of buttermilk, one cup of sour cream, which I have right here, and four tablespoons of butter. But I'm doing a half, like I said, because I don't want to eat too many pancakes. So let's have biscuits to eat too. I'm gonna need a nap later today, trust me. So. <laughs> Uh, I have all of my dry ingredients in here, and we're taking clean, dry whisk, and we're going to what's known as whisk sift. So before I use the sifter, this time I'm just going to use my whisk, and you can see as I'm doing this, hopefully you can see that. I'm going to keep whisking, and all those lumps have disappeared, and I've combined all the ingredients together. So all the salt, the sugar, the baking powder, baking soda, all of it's evenly distributed in my bowl with the flour and I've broken up any lumps. I've also aerated it a little bit too. So you're kind of doing everything uh, that you would do with sifting uh, just with the whisk. The only thing you're not doing is removing any foreign materials. If somebody drops, like if there's a drop of water that got in your flour and formed a little hard dough lump in there, uh, that's not gonna remove anything like that. But um, it's gonna aerate, it's gonna combine, it's gonna remove lumps this way. So uh, just a great quick way of doing that, especially if you don't have a sifter. Don't feel like washing a sifter, that kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with that. So now I still have my whisk, which is just been in the dry, so it's clean. I'm going to take my sour cream and my buttermilk. They're going to go into my third bowl. And I need my spatula. Now, if you didn't have sour cream, you want to use all buttermilk, that's fine with this. Uh, if you had um, sour cream but no buttermilk, you can substitute regular milk for this. Uh, perfectly fine. It's great to have something a little bit thicker if you wanted to use yogurt instead of sour cream, those kind of things. That's perfectly fine for this. So now I'm going to take my bowl and have my one egg. So I'm going to once again crack it on a flat surface. And I'm going to open it up and I'm going to separate my eggs. So I'm going to have two sides, two halves of my shells. I'm going to transfer from one side to the next. So I have my egg whites in one bowl. My egg yolk is going to go into my liquid ingredients. Okay, so I have my egg white separated. And it's very important to make sure you have a clean bowl, clean whisk for this because if there's any oils or fats or anything like that in there, uh, it's going to inhibit your egg whites from, whisk, from whipping up. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my whip, I'm going to whip this by hand. I've done this before. <laughs> and a little trick, if your hand, your arm starts to get fatigued, just change positions. I'm holding it. I'm holding it like this, and I'm going to switch like this. I'm just switch my hand position. So I'm coming at it from another direction, and then I can come back this direction and whisk it like this. So you just keep switching hand positions, and you're going to able to aerate very easily. 
<laughs> Chef, someone asked how much practice it takes to separate the egg white from the yolk like that. Well, <laughs> only a few hundred eggs and you'll be, you'll be a pro. <laughs> um, a little bit, I mean, the trick is, I mean, I, I did, if you're doing more than one egg, if you're doing it into a separate container and then transfer it to your larger container, just in case you break the membrane on the yolk and you start getting a little uh, egg yolk in there, we call that goldfish because it's little bits of egg yolk that are floating in there. And egg yolk, uh, you're a nutritionist too, you know this, uh, egg yolk has fat, egg white does not. So the fat in the egg yolk is going to keep your egg whites from, from whipping up. So you want to make sure you, we call them clean egg whites. And then you put them through the dish machine and you can your uh, you don't have any, uh, any egg yolks in there. So I'm going to keep going. I gotta say, it looks like you're on fast forward right now. Looks like I'm on fast forward? <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice, beautiful, soft uh, egg white bowl. Someone asked about egg beaters, boxed egg whites. What's that? Someone asked if the boxed egg whites, the egg beaters, would work. Um, not as well. Yeah. Uh, but they, they, I haven't actually, um, I can't say that, uh, I've actually used egg, egg beaters, egg whites before. They might work, I'm not really sure. Uh, theoretically, they would. I might have stabilizers added to them. I need to look into that. I think they do. Fresh egg whites, tend, I found they always tend to whip a little bit better than any kind of package. So you can see we turned from kind of that opaque, clear uh, egg white to a nice white, almost, uh, Almost shaving cream like. Where's my camera? There we go. Almost shaving cream like consistency. We don't want to over. We don't want to over with it, especially because there's no sugar in this to kind of help stabilize. So I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to turn my attention. Same whisk, right? I'm going to turn my attention to my liquid ingredients, and I'm going to add my melted butter slowly to my liquid ingredients. So we're going to evenly distribute that, and then this is where we have to kind of be somewhat quick with it. We're going to take our liquid ingredient, we're going to go into our dry, and I'm going to switch to my spatula for this, and I'm just going to start stirring these together. And we want it to be lumpy, so we can see we have just barely, I mean, there's maybe a little few pockets of, of dry in there, but it's really, really very lumpy right now, right? Very, very lumpy. At this point, remember, we're gonna keep mixing because we have to add our egg whites to it. So now our egg whites are gonna go in, and we're gonna do what's called folding. We're gonna fold our egg whites in. And folding is, what we do is we have a little rhyme, not really, it doesn't really rhyme, but a little limerick, I guess, if you will. It's 12 o'clock, sorry, yeah, 12 to six, give a quarter turn. So 12 o'clock to six o'clock, as it's facing me, like on an analog clock, uh, digital doesn't work for this. So cross the bottom of the bowl and you take the products on the bottom, you're gonna fold it over the top. So it's a way of gently incorporating your product, okay? And I wanna make sure I don't want to over mix it. I don't want tough pancakes. There shouldn't be any pockets of dry, but there should be some lumps in there. So I'm going to scrape around the bottom and just be really gentle with it. So now you can see we have a very thick mixture and you can see hopefully how lumpy that is. And you're going to want to mix it more because like that doesn't look right. Stop. That's where you want it to be. Okay, so nice and nice and lumpy, ready to go. And I actually like to use an ice cream scoop for this. Because it's so thick, it's giving you a nice round, but you can use a ladle, obviously, because I have, you know, a triggered ice cream scoop uh, at home. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna lightly grease, so I'll just take some of the butter out of my, my container that I melted it in. And I'm just gonna rub my griddle just a little bit with that. Not much, you don't need much, so just a little bit that's left over. It's a little trick. You don't need to melt butter separately for it. And then I'm gonna take 
my, I'm going to move this over a little bit for you guys now. I'm going to just take this, it's a nice scoop, place it, and I can fit about six of these in my grill. So you want to be fairly gentle. You don't want to deflate all those bubbles you made in your egg whites. These end up with really nice, light, fluffy pancakes. This will make about, depending on the size of your scoop, anywhere from eight to 12 uh, pancakes if you're doing a half. It'll make you probably 18 to 24, I would say, depending on the size, uh, if you're doing a full, uh, a full recipe. But like I said, I did a half, so uh, please take note of that. I only did one egg white and everything like that. That was just a half. So now we're gonna let that hang out. And, and cook. We're going to double check our syrup, which has cooled down a little bit. You can see. You have a so we can see our raspberry syrup here. Let's get a little bit closer. It's got the chunks of raspberries in there, and it smells delicious, by the way. So. I'm going to let that sit there. I'm going to check on my gravy. Very nice. And these are just foundations of stuff. If you wanted to add, I've got a rosemary, a giant rosemary bush in the front of my house. If I wanted to add rosemary to this or rosemary to my biscuits, I could. Probably should have because uh, I know Sarah can attest to it, but she probably came up. But it's a giant, I have a giant rosemary bush up front, so it's a great way to use up that kind of stuff. Uh, another thing you could do with this is you could add uh, more raspberries to the top of this. Just sprinkle them in the top, you know, chop the chips if you wanted to, different things to top the pancakes. So uh, we're going to see they're starting to puff up as we see on the top now. And go too far. I'm going to get a plate ready. Now I'm going to grab a biscuit now so you can see we have our biscuit here. Came out really nice, nice and golden brown. And I like baking them together. You get kind of the paler sides on the side so it's nice and soft. You can see, I'm going to just break this one open so you can see. See how kind of easy that, that just broke open like that? Uh, I've got a nice, light, very tender biscuit because we got the butter so small. We shortened, we shortened the gluten in there. Um, and I'm going to get one ready for plate up. Yeah, that one's that one's pretty. That one's gram worthy. We'll use that one. So we're going to split this. Have it ready for our gravy. I'm just going to flip our pancakes here. We have a little bit longer, a little bit more color. You can add powdered sugar. I have a powdered sugar shaker. My wife likes powdered sugar on her pancakes, so we're going to have a powdered sugar shaker just for that. I'll have that ready to go. So now we're going to flip our pancakes. It's pretty good. What temperature is your griddle at? I got a 375. Okay. Those look great. Thank you. Uh, if I can get that one, one more. There we go. I think we're all coming over to eat breakfast at your house today. I've got, I've got plenty, so come on over. <laughs> and you can see because the egg whites, you can see, I don't know if you can see that how close, closely, but you can see how, how tall they've gotten. So they're, they're about mm -hmm. that tall. So the egg whites, all those bu air bubbles that are created in there from the egg whites, and from the baking powder, uh, there's all the bubbles are starting to expand. And as they're expanding when they're baking, the heat's gonna set all the proteins and starches and stuff like that. And you're gonna end up with a really nice, light, fluffy, tender pancake. So um, I really like them as well. So, um, but you can add, I mean, you can add cinnamon and things like that to them uh, for that as well. So gosh, 
I'll be just about ready. What if you wanted to add like something like raspberries inside the pancakes? When would you do, when would you add in top? Addition? There are a couple ways of doing it. Uh, I would probably sprinkle, you can sprinkle on top. Uh, I'm just pressing down a little bit, but I find sometimes when you do that, when you flip them over, they tend to leak out their juices and sometimes they, they burn a little bit, you know, it makes a, a mess. Uh, so sometimes I'll just actually fold them my last little turn two folds when I'm adding, when I'm mixing my, my batter for it. Uh, I'll add my fruit in at that point mm -hmm. or my additions into that point. So that way they're kind of in, encased in the batter. So they're kind of, all the juices kind of stay inside, inside of the pancake. So, um, but you know, if you like them kind of cooked on the outside, you, you can do that as well. So but they tend to get a little, a little sticky, a little caramelized. So I'm going to move you over. Yeah. So, we're almost there. There you go. How's that for a pancake? Wow. You can see that it rose up nice. Yeah, almost like the like the Japanese pancakes. Uh, I've got a little bit a little bit more time. I'm gonna give it another 30 seconds or so. You guys see the Japanese pancakes like that tall? It's almost <laughs> like. Yeah, they're, they're kind of crazy. So we're not going to do those for mothers. That's a little bit ambitious, I think. So I think this one is perfectly, perfectly fine. Kind of a fun one to do. If you've got kids too, you can have them take turns whipping the egg whites. So that'd be a great thing for them to do because you know keep them very busy. They can have be a little competition. So um, on the kids, I can't have Bella do that. She'd probably just eat them. So um, <laughs> problem with having a uh, having dogs uh, is that you know they don't have any thumbs, so you can't they can't help out around the house too much. But so. Uh, for everybody. It's a nice golden brown is what we're looking for. There we go. So I'm going to start putting these on my plate. And then we, you can see we have our nice plate of pancakes, you know, nice in a row, you know, nice in a row like that. Uh, I like putting a little butter on them right now, or we can get a little bit of our raspberry syrup. Right that's someone, someone asks, is there a good way to know when the second side of the pancake is done? Um, yeah, if you if you give it a little poke and it springs back, that's that's how you know when it's done. If it, if it kind of squishes in a little bit, uh, I'd give it a little bit more time. We'll give a little powder on up too, just for fun. Yeah. Because we can. Voila. There we go. Raspberry pancakes. Right? So there's that. Sorry, just a little note to my photographer. <laughs> my producer. So now we have our biscuit that we've cut in half as well. So we're going to get our sausage gravy. Yeah, after I get the rest of these pancakes out so they don't burn. And I'll have to make a little puppy pancake for Bella too, my dog. She gets she gets her own little puppy pancake. So we'll take a nice big scoop of our sausage gravy. We'll put a little side, no powdered sugar on top of that, but that's not fancy, that's some good stick to your ribs kind of southern stuff. So I love biscuits and gravy. This is gonna come out really nice. I tend to like a more tender biscuit like this for biscuits and gravy because you can still eat it with a spoon or a fork. You don't need anything, you're not gonna have a hard time getting through it. But there's our our biscuits and gravy. So um, that will about do it. Are there any questions for me before we wrap everything up? Lisa asked how she could thin out her gravy if it gets too thick. Just add a little bit more milk, easy breezy. And if you don't have any more milk, you can add a little, refer to it as sink stock. So you can add a little water, so <laughs> uh, sink stock. So you can add a little water. If you ran out of milk, that's fine. Add a little milk to it. Uh, it's gonna uh, thin it right back out. Ooh, that's a good looking biscuit someone showed us. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> nice work. Right. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, y'all feel free to show us what you made. We'd love to see yeah. it. Oh, here we got some other people showing us. Oh, there, love yeah, it. It's a great biscuit. All right. Yeah. yeah. Ooh. 
Look at that. I see pancakes and biscuits. That's awesome. All right. Yeah, good work, everyone. Great Love job. That. Great job. Very cool. Well, good. thank you all. This was awesome. Nice Love little gravy there, Beth. <laughs> Very good. Great pancakes. Is it Maggie? Great job. <laughs> all right. Uh, great job, guys. The product looks really good. So thank you uh, for joining me in my kitchen for cooking in quarantine. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I uh, hope everyone has a great Mother's Day. Spend time with their mom. If you are a mom, happy Mother's Day. And to my mom, happy Mother's Day. And that's it. So thank you again so much. And stay tuned. There's tune in with us again on Tuesday for Dough Week. I'm going to be back at the Nogi Lab. I'm going to be making an Indian flatbread called Parathas. And I'll be making uh, some cream puffs for Dough Week. So uh, if you want to join us again, uh, this is definitely not the, the last of these series. So Stay tuned. We have a whole bunch more stuff coming up too. So we've got a couple uh, more raspberry classes coming up um, the next two Thursdays. Um, and yeah, Zach, this is an awesome class. I'm starving now. Happy Mother's Day to all the mamas, all the motherly figures in this whole chat. We celebrate you. We love y'all, and um, have an amazing weekend. Thank you all. Bye, right, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.